suspects are being one case involves the DC FBI is now offering a hundred thousand dollars to see for the police are releasing Welcome to Misty Mysteries. This is a true crime podcast where once a week I bring you a true crime case that is mysterious or unsolved. Uh, this week I'm going to be starting a new segment right at the beginning where I give you one or two facts about true crime depending on how big the facts are. This week's facts are former FBI agent Robert K. Ressler was the man who was credited for, for the term serial killers in 1971 and 30 to 38 percent of psychopaths show abnormal brainwave patterns. This week, I'm going to be covering the case of Georgia Baradar. Georgia Bar- Have you heard of Anchor? Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. When I started Misty Mysteries, I didn't know where to go, and Anchor helped me get Misty Mysteries started without charging me an arm and a leg. Anchor is really my suggestion for anyone looking to start a podcast. It has tools that allow you to record and edit in app or on the website. Anchor distributes your podcast on all the listening places such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Good Pods, and all your favorite listening places. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place and best of all it's totally free on anchor fm and on the anchor app Bardarf was born may 6 1924 in new york city to father george frederick Bardarf and mother constant Dunhauser hauser she was the youngest of her family with a big sister named Constance, who went by Connie, named after her mother, and she was named after her father, George. Georgette comes from a very wealthy family. Her father, George, was an oil tycoon, and because of this wealth, she lived a very good life, going to good schools and traveling a lot. She went to convent school for girls in Long Island till the death of her mother, Constance, in 1935, when the family moved to Los Angeles, where she went to a the prestigious Marwar uh, School, a girls' prep school, and then Westlake School for Girls, where she graduated in 1941. After graduation, she went to live with her sister Connie, and her and Connie's husband, John Francis Dillon Jr. at the Al at the El Palacio Apartments in North Hollywood. These apartments were home to many celebrities of the time. The apartments were not your common apartments. They were very upscale. If you look at a picture of them, uh, they look almost castle-like. They were gated. Uh, The apartments were two stories. They consisted of kitchen, bathroom, bedrooms, and then they also had a private porch and yard. The apartments also had a family who lived there who were the people who came and cleaned the apartments so it's not your average apartments uh, especially in LA she did not always live in the apartments with her sister and brother-in-law um, unfortunately during this time and period after she graduated school Pearl Harbor had happened and World War II started and with the draft her brother-in-law John Francis Dillon went into action and he passed away serving. Her sister, being heartbroken, moved away from the apartments to live with their father and stepmother. During her time living at these apartments, Georgette, she worked for the Woman Service Bureau of the Los Angeles Times and she volunteered at a place called the Hollywood Canteen. The Hollywood Canteen was founded by John Garfield, Betty Davis, and Jewel C. Stein. This was a club for servicemen of World War II that offered food, dancing, entertainment, and usually these men came to the club when they were about to be shipped out. And it was all servicemen and from every branch they were all welcomed including allies of our country everything was free for the servicemen they just needed to be in uniform to get in so to keep the volunteers safe at this club so many of them being women and famous women they were not supposed to exchange numbers with any servicemen invite the servicemen out outside of the club they had their own entrance and exit that they went into that went out and into they went into a well-lit parking lot 
and they were to leave with other people. They were never to leave alone. Now, to kind of go through the timeline of Georgette's life so far, she graduated school in 1941. She worked at the Los Angeles Times, and that was in 1941. And in 1942, she started volunteering at the Hollywood Canteen in in November 1943. She traveled around the United States with her family. She visited San Francisco, New York, El Paso, Louisiana, and she did not return home until July 1944. So obviously her and her family were staying at these places for long periods of time while her father was conducting business. She would write home during her time traveling to her friend June and she would say are you still going to the canteen I think about it every Wednesday night even even though there seemed to be majority of jerks there and she would also say at the present I'm playing bridge and I'm a dummy per usual but maybe I'll be lucky in love since I'm unlucky in guards July 1944 Georgette came back home to Hollywood and she went back home to uh, volunteering at the Hollywood Canteen. Her family came with her, but they decided to go travel some more and live in New York in August 1944, leaving her alone at the El Palacio Apartments. During that time, she again was a volunteer and she formed special relationships friendships with the servicemen. Georgette was said to be a very, very kind person. She wanted to take advantage of the family she was born in and help people out. She would take them to eat, get drinks, have nights out. She'd lend them money or even let them stay at her place. Now, some say that she would give copies of her key. I would like to note that servicemen or military at that time because you know one thing is like oh giving men your keys when you live alone as a woman would not be something we would do nowadays but at that time servicemen it's a world war ii they were held at a very high regard this was the 40s and she was a she was a 20 year old woman and she was bringing men home and it made the neighbors kind of take note of who was coming and going from her apartment. But her friends always said she wasn't going on dates with them. She was just being a friend before they shipped off. And they would always sleep downstairs while well, she slept upstairs. And she even had a boy, a boyfriend who she was going to visit in October 1944. On October 11th, 1944, Georgette spent her day with Rose Gilbert. This is her father's secretary. They went shopping, they had lunch, and Georgette got $175 out in cash for Georgette to buy a plane ticket to El Paso to visit her boyfriend, who she met in July, and exchanged phone calls and letters with. And that night, she went to her normal, after, you know, going out, she went to her normal volunteer shift at the camp teen, but June Uh, her friend that she was writing the letters to said that she was very anxious that night uh she was nervous and she even asked june to spend the night with her but june assumed she was just nervous about her trip to el paso and she told her she can't stay with her and that same night she kind of had two interesting interactions with servicemen so her first interaction was a serviceman who was bothering or causing a little bit of trouble to Georgette. He was forcefully cutting in to all of her dances and conversations with other servicemen. And according to June, Georgette did not like him. And she said he had a bad attitude. But she danced with him because she didn't want to cause trouble. And when she left the canteen that night around 10.30 and driving home, she picked up a hitchhiker. His name was Gordon Adelan, who she talked all about how she was visiting her boyfriend and how excited she was to get home and talked to him on the phone and she dropped this soldier off on Sunset Boulevard and she headed home and Gordon was gonna go be with his family before shipping out that next day. Early morning, like early morning, like think one, two in the morning, on October 12th, the apartment janitor I mentioned his family earlier. His name was Fred Atward. He woke up to what he would describe as heels on the floor and a crashing sound. His apartment was just under Georgette's apartment and he thought maybe she dropped something 
and he went right back to sleep. Another neighbor, a little, maybe 10, 20 minutes later, heard a woman screaming and crying, stop, stop, you're killing me. That neighbor did nothing because he thought it was just a couple fighting and he went back to sleep. Later that day, on October 12th, around 11.10, Fred and Lulu and their daughter, the family I said was the cleaning crew, the Atwoods, arrived at Georgette's apartment to clean like they usually did every day. Except they were a little bit late this day. They usually got there at 10.30, but they got there at 11.10. So they went straight to cleaning. And Lulu kept hearing water dripping. So she went to go investigate what it was. It was coming from upstairs. That's when all Fred could hear downstairs was Lulu screaming. So he ran to where she was. And that's where they found Georgette half naked in the bathtub facing down. Mr. Atwood said... Her face was in the water and her hair was floating on top. He also said the bathtub was about three parts full and he thought she had maybe fainted trying to unplug the drain and in hopes to bring her back, he went to unplug the drain, but it wasn't a pull. I guess it was a different style of drain. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Department was in charge of this case. Deputy A.L. Hutchinson got to georgiana's apartment around 12 10 p.m so about an hour after her body was found and inspector william pinfrace was in charge of the physical evidence on georgette's case deputy hutchinson would recall when he arrived to the scene as when i got the call i went directly out there i took our county camera along and i arrived there and a couple of boys from the hollywood substation were there and a couple of radio men and miss gilbert the secretary was there and i went to the bathroom which was on the second floor and i found a body of a victim in the bathtub and her face was lying on the bottom of the tub straight down and the body lying on the bathtub straight down her bedroom showed signs of someone laying in the bed the blankets were thrown back with indents in the pillow. There was a blood spot between the bed and the bathroom. It was wet as if someone tried to clean it with a wet rag. There was no evidence of anything being stolen, just flipped over ashtrays, and her pajama bottoms were on the ground near her bed. A pathologist named Frank Webb was in charge of Georgette's examination. He found bruising on the right side of her abdomen and face that looked like they were made by fists, grip marks on her lips, face, thighs, and abdomen. She had bruises on her right thigh and cuts on her hands. She was sexually assaulted before her death. Frank Webb determined her cause of death was strangulation from a piece of fabric in her throat. This fabric was a type of bandage used for injuries like sprains. It came from a 10 inch roll. Police found that this type of bandage was not sold in America for 22 years. It was from England or France. Police believe whoever killed her was there to assault her, not kill her. The light outside her apartment was unscrewed, which Mr. Atwood confirmed was not like that before, and all her lights were off. Police were able to get fingerprints off the light bulb, but the fingerprints, they never led to anyone. Her vehicle, a 1936 Oldsmobile Coupe, which was under her sister Connie's name, was found 10 miles away from the apartment. The car ran out of gas and was not believed to be left there on purpose. The vehicle had damage to the left fender and grille on the front, but it was not determined if it was new or old. There was also fingerprints on the car that again didn't lead to anyone. There was a hundred suspects and many theories. So let's talk about the top suspects 
And some of the ones that first came to my mind, the first that came to my mind was the guy who was bothering her at the Hollywood canteen. Police found him. His name was Cosmo Balopi. When questioned, he said he wasn't bothering her, that she was enjoying dancing with him, and he left at 11.30 with a Sergeant James Durskull, and they went back to the barracks. The police were able to rule him out after confirming this alibi. The next was Sergeant Gordon Adeland, and he was questioned, but he was with his brother, spending time with his family before he was shipped out, and he was ruled out with a solid alibi. Police also were able to rule out Mr. Atwood after he was questioned multiple times. Her boyfriend, Private Jerome Brown, was investigated where he told the police how they met and when they met. He admitted to the letters and the phone calls and he even gave the police those letters. He was ruled out when confirmed he was in Texas during her murder. Some other people that were questioned were Robert George Pollock White, who was charged with the murder of a 65-year-old woman in a very similar fashion in San Diego. He was in LA at the time, but denied killing her, and he couldn't be linked to her either. Otto Stevens Wilson, who killed two women in downtown LA, was also questioned, but nothing linked him to her either. In December 1944, a man named John Sim Simpter walked into the FBI offices in San Francisco and confessed to her murder. He, w he told the police that he and Georgetta met in on a streetcar. She asked him to spend the night at her home, and he said, okay. And when they got there, there was a soldier visiting, but once that soldier left, he murdered her. Police didn't believe the story. The evidence didn't match. The stories didn't match. That's when he told the police he lied because he was suicidal, but he couldn't get himself to the point where he could do it and thought the electric chair would be easier. The next lead came almost a year later after all these people had been questioned and the false confession, and in September 1945, a letter was written by what is to believe to be her killer. The letter read to the Los Angeles police, Almost a year ago, Georgetta Baradarf, at age 20, Hollywood Canteen hostess, was murdered in her apartment in West Hollywood. Between now and October 11th, a year after her death, the one who murdered her will appear at the Hollywood Canteen. The murderer will be in uniform. He's been in action in Okinawa. The murder of Georgette Baradarf was divine retribution. Let the Los Angeles belief arrest the murderer if they can. The police at the time believed this was a hoax, it was a prank, but nowadays a lot of true crime authors and podcasters believe that that these le this letter was real and they should have followed the lead. Her case went cold, and this was until 1947 when Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, was murdered. Many reporters and writers added a twist and they tried to link the two, but the police just never could link the two women's murder. One link people tried was that the women were friends, but they, but the women never lived anywhere where they could have met before. And Georgetta was murdered two years before Elizabeth Short even got to Los Angeles. The two women, also, they lived very different lives. Georgetta came from a very rich family, spent her life traveling and being a socialite in Hollywood, where Elizabeth spent most nights at the theater due to being homeless. On top of this, their murders were very, very different. Elizabeth was tortured and dumped and posed at a different location, where Georgetta seemed to be assaulted. It was an assault gone wrong. It was not very planned. Uh, that's not to say that maybe it was the same person and he was maybe getting a start, but the police didn't believe that was very likely. Unfortunately, Georgetta's life was cut early in a very violent assault. Her killer was never found and probably never will be found. Her killer most likely lived his whole life getting away with what he did or died in service. If he is alive, he would be in his 90s or even 100s. Hopefully one day, with the fingerprints and evidence that was found, someone may be able to open this case. For now, her case remains unknown. I would like to thank you for listening, and if you like this podcast, 
or you like this episode, please leave a good review, share it with your friends, and you can even follow my social medias. My Instagram is at Misty underscore Mysteries, or Twitter at Mysteries Misty. Please stay tuned to next week. I will be having two episodes, and that is because I will have a bonus episode for my birthday. Thank you again for listening, and I'll see you next week.